What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for Swift News. We're back after taking a week off last week for travel. As always, the links for everything you see here will be in the GitHub repo. The link to that repo is in the description. And throughout the week, if you find something interesting, tweet it out with hashtag Swift News, and I'll check that out before I put together the show. Still up the rundown and get into it. To kick things off, we have an update to the Swift algorithms Swift package. I'll explain. Uh, so we have new algorithms. Well, real quick, I, I featured this a while ago, but if you're not familiar with Swift algorithms, it's from Apple. It's a Swift package that you can install to basically give you access to like more algorithms and it is open source. So, you know, people can contribute over time, you know, a bunch of different algorithms. And I guess the news here is we got an update three days ago that has a, an, you know, an exciting group of new algorithms contributed by, by the community. Uh, so trimming while, min of count, striding by, but again, if you're not familiar with Swift algorithms, this is kind of the example of the stuff that will you know, grow and evolve over time as this open source project you know, gets more contributions. So if any of these algorithms suit your needs, here you go, check it out. Moving on, we got more guidance about the App Store privacy labels. Uh, this is kind of like the nutrition labels for privacy that came out at the end of the year. Again, just more guidance, uh, including uh, more information about types, such as email and text messages, gameplay content, uh, data collected in web views, et cetera. And if you're not familiar with this App Store privacy labels, again, I featured this a little bit ago too, click the learn more and here you go. Here's the full rundown. Here's what they look like if you're not familiar, uh, but this is a very long detailed basically how-to article from Apple. You see, here's the table of contents on the left, you, you know, click through that. So anyway, more updates on App Store privacy labels. Next up, we have a great article from Alex called AppKit is done. All right, that's a bit excessive and, and he'll even admit. Uh, but the point of this article is, you know, building an, a Mac app in Swift UI is what he went through, uh, is not so bad. And he kind of demonstrates uh, everything here, navigation and great animated GIFs. This is a very detailed and visual article. I'm not gonna go through everything because as you can see, there's code, there's animated GIFs, there, you know, there's talking about stuff. Here's the sidebar. So if you're building a Mac OS app using Swift UI and you're just getting started, I think this is a great place uh, to kind of check out, right? I know this is gonna help me a lot in my app, but uh, anyway, we'll scroll through this now. You can definitely check this out. I wanna get to the conclusion um, because obviously that headline is kind of clickbaity, right? App kit is done, um, but oh, it's longer than I thought. Uh, okay, we're almost there, we're almost there. Okay, conclusion, right? Is Swift UI perfect? No, of course not. It's still super early, you know, but he said he doesn't have a lot of uh, bugs to report and AppKit integration is like always there. Um, is AppKit done? Also no, right? There's still a lot SwiftUI can't do, but again, you can always drop down to AppKit. Of course, we expect that to improve and evolve over time because again, it is still early for SwiftUI, but here's a, a big thing, right? Is SwiftUI a game changer for Mac OS, right? And it's all about, he says it's economics, but really this line sums it up. You know, the calculation has changed, right? The main impediment for people building Mac apps, and I'll say myself included, right? Like AppKit, there's, there's millions of iOS engineers as you see here, but how many of those iOS engineers like really know MapKit? A very small percentage. So that was the main impediment for great like Mac OS apps, right? So now with Swift UI, right, the, the path to delivering great native experience on Apple platforms has never been clear. And again, it, it's still early, but like he says, you can see the path and it's very clear. And I'm in agreement. I think the future of Mac OS apps is pretty bright. Moving on, we got a quick tutorial from Federico here uh, all about this HUD, right? You've seen this when you connect your AirPods or you know, flip your phone to silent mode like he mentions here, you get this little HUD that pops down to let you know what's up. Uh, we don't have access to this right now as iOS developers, like the native version. It wouldn't surprise me is, you know, in a, in a year or two or so, we actually do get access to this native behavior and we can trigger this automatically. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, but uh, in the meantime, or if we never get it, Federico here shows you how to do that. And it's relatively simple uh, in Swift UI. So I'll scroll down here to the animated GIF uh, so you can see it in action, right? Show hide HUD and that pops down. My screen's blown up, so the GIF quality is a little, little, little shaky, but you can see what's going on here. You can basically create your own little animation uh, to show that HUD and kind of create it yourself until we get access to the native version, if we ever do. Next up, I have an article from Edouard Barbier here. Uh, Indie Dev Tips, Diversified Portfolio versus Big Idea, the right approach. And there's you know, a big long article about this, definitely check it out, but it's an interesting question that you know, the answer is gonna be different for everybody, but if you're thinking about going the indie dev route, I think it's something you know, to consider, right? Do you focus on one idea? You have one app that you're working on, all your eggs are in that basket, so to speak, or do you build three or four apps and diversify? And Edward goes into uh, an issue he had 
about a year ago with YouTube, right? He, one of his apps is YouTube Tracker. So he's relying heavily on the YouTube API. Well, obviously anytime you're relying heavily on a third party API, you're at risk. And he had some issues. I, I don't know the whole story. I don't want to go into it and misspeak, but it kind of rang alarm bells in his head. He's like, wow, all my eggs are in this YouTube tracker basket and YouTube can, you know, screw me over in the blink of an eye. So that caused him to diversify. So that's just one reason why you may want to diversify. But I like that he goes on to, uh, you know, what, what do we do with all these ideas? It's a gift and a curse being a developer, right? The gift is you have an idea, you can build it. That's awesome. But it's also a curse because you're like, you're always getting ideas. So you always want to like build, he calls it, you know, the, the shiny new object syndrome, right? Oh, I got an idea. Let me build it. And you start prototyping it. Cause let's be honest, like the fun part of development is prototyping an idea. You know, the, the first part where development kind of sucks to be honest is like, once you're, once you're over that honeymoon phase of a project and now you're into the nitty gritty, right? It's, it becomes less fun. So that's why you gotta be careful because those shiny objects become a lot more attractive when you're in the less fun phase of development. But I wanted to share this article because I thought it was just an interesting idea and you can hear his thoughts on it. But uh, again, there's no right answer. It's going to be different for everybody. But as an indie dev, do you focus on one main product and put all your effort into that? Or do you diversify a little bit? I don't know. Interesting discussion. Next up, I wanted to share an article from David Seek, how I would solve the Facebook iOS app design interview. And to clarify this a bit, it's not like for a designer. This is like oftentimes in an interview for an engineer position, you'll get a question, hey, design a messaging app. And it's more talking about like the design systems, the architecture, all that stuff. And it's kind of hard to build like tutorials and content around this because it's, it's so broad, like it goes so many different directions. And I think David does a great job of kind of highlighting all the directions it can go. You know, at the end of the day, he does pick one direction and give you an example of it. But, you know, if you're not familiar with these types of interviews, right, where you go to the interview and they say, design a messaging app, or how would you design Instagram's home feed, which is the example David uses here. Um, this is a, a great kind of mock walkthrough of how that could go and some good practice and, and maybe what to expect. And I think David does a great job of highlighting a lot of uh, things here, right? He, he talks about, I uh, want to, right here, I scrolled back past it. Um, clarifying what is going on uh, is a big thing here, right? Clarification, right? Um, because this is also a big part of the interview, like not just designing the system, but what questions you ask, what, what restrictions you have, because those are very important things to ask, right? He, he goes through some, uh, some examples here, like what part of the app should I design? Authentication, the feed, user profiles, messaging, right? You know, if it is a messenger app, what kind of attachments will be supported, right? You can see all the deeper questions you can ask that clarify. And that is just, in my opinion, that is just as much of part of the interview, like what questions you're asking, how you're thinking about it, as it is the actual system you come up with. So again, David does a great job highlighting all of that. Uh, if you want practice on these types of interviews, definitely read this article. Or if you're not familiar with them, you've never done one, must read. Moving on to an article that's a little bit above my, my level here, how Uber deals with large iOS app size. And I say it's a little bit above my level because they get into like advanced compiler techniques. And once you start getting into the lower level compiler stuff, one, just to be honest, I kind of lose interest when we, when we get down there. So I don't really know much about it. Um, but if you are in that situation, you're working on a very large app with scale and, and you kind of are interested in that compiler stuff, I think this can be very helpful because it talks about how Uber like, you know, their, their code base has millions and millions of lines of code, uh, so they say, and they're constantly struggling to get under Apple's uh, download limit, right? I believe it's 200 megabytes now, the last I checked. It might be different, don't quote me on that. But, right, especially for an app like Uber, you have to be able to be download over the air. You don't have to require Wi-Fi, right? Because if you're out on the street trying to get a Uber, you need to be able to download it. And they even say, right, like, when app size crosses the download size limit, it leads to a 10% reduction in app installations, 12% reduction in signups, and 20% reduction in first time bookings. For a company the size of Uber, 10, 12, 20%, those are gigantic numbers when it comes to money. So this is a huge deal reducing the app download size. So anyway, I won't dive into the details too much here because to be honest with you, I don't know what they're even saying. It's over my head because again, it is like advanced compiler tactics and like machine code, all that stuff. So if that stuff does interest you or you're working on a very large app that is constantly struggling to, you know, meet the download size limit, definitely check this one out. Moving on to Twitter wisdom, we have Alberto here. I'm not sure if he created this, but I've seen this being tweeted around, right? How we're taught to measure success, salary and job title, right? I'm a senior engineer at Google making $500,000 a year. Wow, you're so successful, right? That's kind of like how you're taught. But, and I agree with this, 
what's the reality, especially in like my opinion, yes, job title and salary matter. No one's saying that doesn't matter, but I believe in quality of life a lot more than the salary. And I will say that as a very like privileged point of view, being a software engineer, which if you're watching this, maybe you're trying to become a software engineer if you already are, but we have it pretty good. We have, you know, on average, we make above average salary. If you're an employed software engineer, your basic needs are probably met. Of course, that's not going to be true for everybody, but you know, on the whole, your basic needs are probably met. So in my opinion, once the basic needs are met, I'm going to optimize for quality of life. And that's where this comes in, right? Free time, enjoying what you do, physical health, mental health, right? You know, I, I, this actually happened to me. I didn't take a position at PayPal because the commute from San Francisco to PayPal was like two hours on a train. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to play basketball due to that commute. And that was like a huge deal to me. Uh, even though the position would have been great, it was kind of carved out just for me. Uh, the pay raise would have been very, very nice, you know, multiple tens of thousands of dollars, but I didn't do it because I didn't want to give up basketball, the free time, the, the quality of life I had at Aluna, like was amazing. So Again, I, I believe in not going for the higher salary at all costs. I think you're gonna end up very unhappy that way. Again, get your basic needs met and then optimize for quality of life. At least that's just my opinion. I know that's not gonna be the same for everybody, especially when it comes to money. Everybody's different, but I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Now this kind of shifts into Instagram wisdom, but we're getting there via Twitter from uh, Sam Jarman here. He started an Instagram account. Uh, you have it here called Bites of Wisdom. So if you're on Instagram, uh, give him a follow, but uh, just little, little bites of wisdom throughout your day, right? Clever code isn't, I like that one, uh, right? A workaround today is a feature tomorrow. We've all been there, right? So anyway, just a little, nice little stuff in your Instagram feed uh, if you wanna throw that a follow for, for more bites of wisdom. And then finally, our LOLs of the week here, uh, getting started with iOS, step one, download Xcode. Very easy, level one, one. <laughs> Dealing with code signing, yeah, not so much. <laughs> and then finally, uh, this one can pretty much be said without comment, right? I can't wait for the Apple car. Yeah, got a good chuckle out of that one. Uh, that'll, <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if that's actually how you charge the Apple car if it was like underneath it? Anyway, uh, that's gonna wrap it up for this week's episode. Uh, we'll see you in the next one.